Welcome, everyone. Our next speaker, John Laycock, uh, is going to start now. Okay, how's that? Everybody hear me okay? Okay. Uh, if I start kind of losing volume, just let me know. Uh, sometimes I kind of trail off a little bit, kind of my Midwest monotone voice going to work. Uh, but anyway, thank you guys so much for being here today. Um, I'd like to kind of talk to you about some of some things that uh, I find interesting, and I'm hoping that you guys might might take an interest in some of the things I have to talk about. Um, first things first, I would like to uh, just thank uh, my company, White Ops, uh, for giving me some time to put together some slide decks and be here to talk with you folks. Uh, my boss was very supportive in, in giving me some time on Friday to uh, feverishly put together these last, the last few slides I have here. So um, just wanted to give them a shout out. All right. Uh, so today, um, for those of you that know me, I, there's a few familiar faces in the room. I uh, see one of my former co-speakers back there, uh, Chris. How are you doing, Chris? <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, my name is John Laycock. I've uh, been in the uh, InfoSec space for, for quite a few years now. I actually started out in uh, forensic video many years ago and was able to pivot over into computer forensics, uh, working over at uh, DC3 uh, for a long time and uh, worked in a couple of different directorates there. Um, after that, I went over to our, uh, our commercial forensics team and kind of bounced around, as you can see there, I've, I've worked at Fidelis on their threat research team for a couple of years uh, before going over to Medicare, working in their SOC, and currently I'm a threat intel manager with, with White Ops. And, uh, I have a Twitter handle, Malware Elf, not really that interesting, I don't think. I just kind of retweet things that I find interesting, uh, maybe make a few sarcastic comments now and again, but uh, if you want to reach out to me after this talk, uh, that's a pretty good place to find me. So the title of my talk today, as you can see, is Looking to the Past to Better Understand Threat Intelligence. And this is something that kind of marries up uh, two topics that I, I find very interesting and fascinating, uh, genealogy and threat intel research. Uh, just out of curiosity, does anybody in here study their family history at all? Really? OK, great, great. Um, you know, so genealogy for me has been, been kind of an interesting thing. Um, you know, I guess, you know, why, why am I kind of talking about these two things together? Um, and, you know, the simple answer is I like solving a puzzle, you know, kind of going through that, that family history, it's a lot like threat intel. You know, you're, you're trying to figure out where something came from, how did it get to be there, um, and just, just figuring it out. And that's something in combination with history, I've always had a lot of interest in, in solving puzzles and just where did we come from and, you know, your family, I mean, it's, it's kind of a, uh, you know, kind of a really kind of basic need for me, I guess. Um, I was very fortunate. I had a grandmother, so she uh, really was kind of our family historian, had a lot of knowledge, and, uh, you know, I was very close with her, and so I kind of learned a lot of my own family history from her. And when my son was born, I kind of kind of had a renewed interest. She, she had passed away a couple years before that, but I kind of had a new, uh, kind of a renewed interest in figuring out where did my family come from? I knew bits and pieces of things that I kind of put together. And you know, sometimes you, you kind of misremember things you know, from growing up. You think, oh, well, this is what it was. And then you start digging into it. And you kind of realize that things were a little bit different than the way you remembered them. And I started uh, just looking around. Uh, I got online um, you know, and uh, saw there were a lot of different sources. I actually went to my, my public library and went through census data and did a lot of the things that you know, genealogists will go and do. And very early on, I, I was, I, I had been told through our family history that we had some ancestors that were in the Revolutionary War. And that really interested me. I always like having a goal when I do these things, right? And so I decided I wanted to try to trace my, my family roots back to Revolutionary War and maybe get into the Sons of the American Revolution. Um, which is a, it's a great group. Is anybody here a member of that by chance? You are. Okay, great. Which chapter are you with? Okay, I'm Westminster out of Maryland. So, <clears throat> uh, so yeah, one of the first things I did is I set up an Ancestry.com account. And, you know, I started looking around, and that kind of started a seven-year effort uh, to get through 
and get that documentation together and, and, and go through my lineage. Um, on the flip side here th with Threat Intel, um, you know, it's a kind of a similar thing. I started out doing a lot of computer forensics. Um, I kind of migrated into network forensics a little bit. Uh, I got to work in a SOC. You know, I worked on a threat research team, and Threat Intel was really a nice place for me to kind of take my uh, very kind of wide background and my, you know, my experiences and apply them into the Threat Intel mindset, and um, you know, kind of start doing threat analysis. And so. What, what I think we're going to find here as I go through this talk today is that these two topics actually have a lot of overlap. I mean, at their, at their essence, they're just research. So your basic research, research methodology is going to be very similar, whether it's genealogy or threat intel analysis. <clears throat> so what I learned, and you guys can see you know, up here, genealogy research is not easy. Like I said, it took me seven years to figure out you know, where, where, and get all the documents together I needed to uh, join the Sons of the American Revolution. I also learned through a lot of trial and error to take notes. And this, this is true of both, right? If you don't take notes, you, you start going down a path and then all of a sudden you forget where you were, you know, an hour ago. You've been clicking through all these different websites and you lose track of your, your place very easily. Um, Ancestry.com, as great as it is, it's not the co complete solution. Okay, it doesn't beat going down to maybe a, uh, a state archive somewhere, uh, going down to your public library, maybe a local historical society. Just like VirusTotal, great tool, and I'm not bashing them, they're just, that was the first name that popped into my head. Okay, I use VirusTotal a lot, it's a great tool. Uh, but it's, it's not all-inclusive. You know, sometimes you have no, no uh, frame of reference for where maybe a sample came from. Multiple sources, critical, you know, if you can tie in multiple pieces of uh, documentation. They're, they're really important to help you with your analysis. Um, you just, you know, the Russian proverb, trust but verify. Okay, again, very important. Um, we need to be able to trust our sources. You know, we need to have some, some veracity to their, to their information. Um, and, and don't jump to conclusions, right? It's very easy to do. You wanna jump, you know, when you start doing your research, a lot of times you wanna jump right to the end point. Slow down. Make sure you have your documents together, your proof. It's very important. And you're always going to find contradictions and things that don't line up just right. Okay? And that's true whether it's threat analysis or whether it's genealogy. Okay? And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about some of that as we go along here, but um, those contradictions are really important. And, and it's okay to embrace them. Okay? When you do your report, your threat intel report, or you do your genealogy research, just put it out there. Okay? Somebody else may know what that is. It might trigger something. Okay? It might help them explain something and help you learn a little bit as well. <clears throat> so if you're interested in getting into genealogy, here's a great place to start, and that's with your family. Ask questions. Um, you know, I, as, as close as I was to my grandmother, there are a lot of questions that in hindsight I wish I would have asked. And, you know, that's something that happens. And, you know, when you're younger, you don't think about these things. Um, there's a lot, you know, if she was here today, there's a lot of things I'd like, I would like to know. She was born in 1912. Her grandfather was a Civil War veteran. Think about that. That's 160 years of experiences and, and, and knowledge. Um, you know, that, and I, wish, I have stories, but I wish I had more. Okay. Um, one other aside, um, didn't really fit in here, but I wanted to talk about it. If you have old family photos, label them, okay? I went through um, my other grandmother's. Uh, I have boxes of pictures. Some of these are pictures from the 20s and 30s, and there's people on there. They look like they're having a great time. They're smiling and laughing, but I have no clue who they are, okay? And I, I have these photos because I'm like, well, what do I do with these? I did go through and badger a whole bunch of aunts and uncles and cousins. I said, hey, who are these people? And I was able to identify some, but not all. Um, so if you do have some old photos, take some time to label them. If you know who those people are, it's really important. Uh, the other thing that's useful when you're getting started in gene genealogy, you probably have a family member that has done a lot of research already. You know, you're going to have a family historian. And, <clears throat> you know, maybe Ann Harriet or somebody else, um, you know, Cousin Bob or somebody. 
And it's, it's really important to, to identify those people. Maybe you don't know that there's a family historian and they, they may have a lot of information for you already. Um, and that, that will help you in your research. Maybe they've gone down a lot of paths that you're about to go on and you can benefit from their knowledge. But as the picture here shows with William Wallace, beware of family lore. Okay? I have a great, great example of this from my own experiences. My grandmother had told me, um, I grew up north of Chicago uh, in Lake County, Illinois, and there's a small town there called Gray's Lake. I have an ancestor from the area named Gray. And my grandmother had told me that that was our family, our kin. And so I thought that was pretty cool. And so I actually, um, as I started to, to do my family, family research, I uh, called down to the local historical society and said, hey, yeah, I'm a descendant of the Grays of Grays Lake, and I'd like to know, you know if you have any information or anything like that. And in talking to uh, some of the folks at the historical society there, I found out that there were actually a couple of Gray families that had located into the area there in the 1850s. And my family was not one of the families that Grays Lake was named for. And that's okay. You know, that's just, you know, you, you kind of get that family lore where it snowballs down over 150 years and you, you, it's very easy to make assumptions like that. What I did find out about my particular line as I did some additional research is that they were actually French. They had come from upstate New York um, and France before that obviously, but they had changed their names after the Revolutionary War from Lafayette to Gray. So again, you need to kind of walk through these things and kind of learn about them. There's some more family lore with the LaPierre that I haven't been able to substantiate. My grandmother has told me that LaPierre was apparently a doctor for General Lafayette, um, but I haven't been able to, to verify that one. So we have to kind of you know, keep in mind of this as we go along and do our research. <clears throat> so on the threat intel side, we have very similar things here, right? So when you start doing threat intel analysis, even if you're working in a SOC, or if you're working in a, uh, maybe a company and you have a lot of customer telemetry coming back, you know, great place to start, talk to your coworkers. Learn about your environments that you're working in, just like you would talk with your family members. Find network diagrams. You know, understand your data sets, where everything is coming from. Understand the relationships, what kind of data you have, data you have, what kind of limitations that are in place with, those, with that data. Can you use this publicly? Can you not use this publicly? Um, where did it come from? What does it show you? Is it incomplete? Is it reliable? Um, so whether that's on a network diagram or just understanding where the data is, that's, a, that's another step that you want to put into place. <clears throat> you learn about your company processes, your IT stacks, you know, understand where things fit, where we're looking inside of your network so that you can make sure that you're making the right conclusions when you do, the, do look at this stuff. Hey, Damien, how you doing? Thanks for coming. <laughs> so, um, but just like we have to worry about family lore, we also need to worry about the from what I know type of remarks, okay? Because that can really lead you astray. Somebody may have an understanding of something, that information may be outdated, um, it may even be incorrect. And so a great uh, story I have where I encountered that, I was working in a SOC and we had a uh, mouse spam campaign <clears throat> coming through our email, and I, I uh, had a couple of emails I needed to take a look at, and I started uh, parsing the email headers just to kind of get a feel. That was something I'd always do, just to kind of get a feel for maybe where the uh, uh, email originated, uh, maybe some interesting things. And I started looking. I realized there was a bunch of uh, missing information in the network hops. It, it, it didn't have the normal path that I would expect for our emails coming into our servers. It was missing a large chunk of our security stack. So it was really literally coming from the outside world right into our servers and then right to the end users. And I, I was concerned, uh, <laughs> as you can imagine. So we started looking around. And because this was a large organization, you know, we had different teams, different contracts to administrate different parts of our network. So there was kind of a natural disconnect. And so as I was talking to my coworkers, I got a lot of from what I know type of remarks. From what I know, Joe handles that, or Dave handles that, or from what I know, that's configured to go here and then here and you know, wind its way through our network. And as I started digging around, we finally 
got to a point where we, we contacted our email server team and engaged them and started talking to them and kind of explained what we thought the issue, what there was an issue going on. And, and they were able to, we had just actually recently went to Office 365. And when we incorporated Office 365 into our email uh, service, uh, the email security stack, you know, Office 365 has their own security within their product. We had actually had a third party um, uh, security stack, and so we had chosen not to go with the, the Microsoft offering. And when we did that, we did not know we had some configuration errors within our setup. And so when we did that, what was happening is that any time we got an email that looked like it was coming from an internal user, it just sent it right through because it assumed that it had already gone through our security stack. So we had mail spam going right to the end users, never going through security. Obviously a big problem. It was actually, once we got the Microsoft engineers in, in, um, involved in this, they, they were help, able to help us write up a couple of transport rules and that allowed, that basically forced all emails to go through our security stack. So point being here is that, you know, I had to dig through and kind of get through the, from what I know and kind of break through the barriers a little bit and make sure that I understood the problem. And um, that, that helped us improve our security posture as a result. <clears throat> so Ancestry.com, and I've mentioned it a couple of times already, it's really, probably a starting point for a lot of folks when they get into genealogy. And it's a great tool, there's a lot of information up there. Um, you know, in addition to just the kind of social aspects of maybe connecting with some family members, uh, you know, you have massive, massive amounts of databases that they've kind of incorporated into their system. They alert you on it. Um, anything from census data, marriage certificates, ship manifest data, uh, military records. And, you know, we've probably all seen the commercials, you know, when they identify a match, they give you a little, little leaf, you know, telling you you've got some new family connection to go check out. Um, that should start to sound a little familiar to you. That should be like what you, maybe if you've used a SIM or a TIP, you know, when you get an alert. Okay, same idea here. It really is. You know, I had actually, um, I mentioned the social aspect. I connected with a, a distant cousin I had never met before. He lives up over in uh, Philadelphia, he's the lawyer out there. And he'd actually done a lot of research on my family. And I, like I said, I'd never met him. He had never met any of my family um, out in Northern Illinois, even though he had actually come out a couple of times. And so he, uh, you know, we got to, got to talking and we did a lot of research together, great guy. Um, we actually uh, worked with one of my first cousins that I know, and we found the ship manifest from when my ancestor came into the country. So. In the 1820s, I actually have a John Laycock that came to America, came into Philadelphia. I thought that was, uh, that was a lot of fun for me. Um, Don, my cousin Don, later found his uh, uh, citizenship applications. And, and kind of looking through the documents, we realized that he was illiterate. He actually had, a mark, he had to make his mark on the paperwork. So there's a lot of really interesting things that you can find out from these old documents. And you think, you know, the 1820s, what am I going to learn from this? Well. I learned he was illiterate when he came to America. Um, some people might argue I'm illiterate, but uh, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting to kind of know where we came from with this stuff. The other thing that you have to really think about with any sort of crowdsourced data is it is crowdsourced. Okay? What is the quality of it? It may not be diligently sourced. You, know, you, have to, you have to sort through a lot of extraneous information, and you've got to look at the data and, and, and the source and figure out, hey, is this trustworthy? Can I trust this? You know, it's very easy to get into Ancestry.com and just start clicking things and all of a sudden you've got, you know, 10, 12 generations of family going back to Norway or wherever the heck it might be. But if you made a wrong turn two or three generations back, you know, you've got to make sure you have the sources to support what you're doing. And if you go online and you see somebody at family tree and you see that they've gone through these 10 or 12 generations, you might think, hey, you know, they, they've, done the, they've done the work here. Not necessarily, okay? You have to really, you know, parse through it a little bit and, and double check on it. Those little leaves, you know, they might be, might be getting you a lead, but, you know, it might be a false positive, right? It might be, you know, another John Laycock or another, you know, John Smith somewhere. And so you've got to really make sure that does this make sense? 
just like you have to look at that with some of the data you might do when you're doing threat intel analysis. So corollary to using Ancestry.com might be using a threat intel platform, a TIP. Okay? Once you kind of evolve to a certain point in your, your, your analysis, you know, you're probably going to be wanting to look at any one of the multitude of tips that are out there. You know, I won't um, get into the specifics of a tip, but you know, basically just a place to aggregate all your data, take your feeds, bring in your, your data, and, and do some data enrichment, whatever it is you need to do for your particular job function. Okay. These systems are really important, and they really help you out by going through a lot of data, enriching it for you, looking at your, your feeds, <clears throat> and really giving you um, you know, a rich uh, data set to go through and help you in your your day to day analysis. Now, just like when you get that leaf, you got to think about the source of the information. All right, just because an IP, you've got a feed that says this IP address is malicious, that doesn't mean it is. All right, how many of us have heard the story of the young SOC analyst that blocked 8.8.8.8? Right. <laughs> so I mean that it's almost kind of a trope now. I don't know if it really ever happened or not, but. You know, at some point somewhere, I'm sure somebody blocked Google, um, but they learned from that, I would hope. <clears throat> at the end of the day, you've got to do your own vetting of the data, just like you do in genealogy. You've got to make sure you have good data that you're looking at. Also consider cost. I didn't really speak about this on the ancestry, uh, you know, the, the previous slide, but there's a lot of information that's available out there. Some of it's free. Some of it is free and good. Some of it's free and not so good. And some of it's going to cost you a lot of money and it's crap. Some of it, you know, it just depend, depends on what you're doing. So you need to really consider the cost. Am I getting value for this? Is this useful or not? Now, as you go through and do your research, whether it's on threat intel or genealogy, you're going to hit a brick wall. That's what we call it in ancestry. I'm sorry, genealogy, sorry. Um, you're going to hit a brick wall. You're going to get stuck. And this is where you start to evolve and become a better genealogy researcher, a better analyst, is you know, when you do get stuck, what do you do? You gotta get creative, you gotta start looking around, get different approaches, kind of break out of your bubble and, and start to look at things differently. Maybe get out from behind the keyboard, go to a library somewhere, go to a, a local history center, uh, maybe a church, maybe mail a letter, okay? So, my brick wall, as I was going through, and I said it took me seven years to get the Sons of the American Revolution application through. So my brick wall was my great, great, great grandmother, Mary Gray. And she was buried in a small cemetery uh, back home in Diamond Lake, Illinois, uh, in 1852. And one of the problems I had with her was I knew her married name, and this is not an unusual problem, but because she was married um, in, eight, in 1842, I think, and I don't have proof on this, this is just a suspicion of mine um, based on her children's ages, but uh, the census data starting in 1850, all the census data every year or every 10 years changes, and they ask for different pieces of information. So starting in 1850, they start to list out all the inhabitants of a house. Well, prior to that, they only told you who the head of the household was and gave you a count of who might have lived in the house. And so that makes it kind of uh, difficult sometimes to find out, you know, maybe who all the children are for a particular family. And so that was kind of my situation here. So Mary Gray, you know, she's married, passes away in 1852. Um, you know, I don't have uh, older census data to link her to her family. Um, you know, I, I mentioned I believe she was married around 1842 in upstate New York. Uh, at that time, there were no death records kept in Lake County, Illinois. In the 1850s, I didn't have an obituary that I could find. Um, I did find later on. Oh, actually, I contacted the cemetery, and she was one of the first people buried at this particular cemetery. They had to pull out the old book; they didn't even have it in their their records. And they had records showing that her husband bought four cemetery plots, and that she uh, uh, was buried there along with uh, a couple of other family members. Um, but they didn't have much more information for me. <clears throat> Um, however, I found one of her daughter's death certificates from 1925, and it lists out her mother's maiden name. So now I have her, her maiden name of Soper. And I'm fairly certain I know who her family is. I know where they're from, upstate New York. 
Um, I just don't have the links tying her to her parents. Um, her, I, I have a number of her siblings that I've managed to connect back uh, to the parents through other records, but not, not Mary Gray. She was one of the first ones to leave the home. Um, <clears throat> So her father actually was kind of interesting. And so, you know, I would, at this point, I had been trying to go up to Mary Grace, and now I'm kind of coming down from up on top from her, from her father and her grandfather. Her father actually served in the War of 1812. And there are records available at the National Archives. So I reached out to the National Archives, got a wonderful trove of information, but nothing tying me to Mary Gray, unfortunately. Uh, later on, um, I, I actually met, there were a number of letters, handwritten letters, to the US government that were in this packet. This was part of land bounty applications. So when you served in the War of 1812, you were actually able to get a couple hundred acres out west. They would give it to you for your, your service. And so his, um, this ancestor, his wife had been applying for that and she had written affidavits from people. Um, and so I had a number of handwritten letters which were interesting, but again, not tying me back to my ancestor, Mary Gray. Um, Joseph Soper is this gentleman's name. Has, his father actually served in the Revolutionary War. And so, um, again, I don't have records you know, leading back to there as well. So it's kind of frustrating, but um, I kind of banged my head on this brick wall for quite a while. And finally, um, I realized I needed to kind of go around and, and come at this from a different, different angle. And so one of my cousins actually had, had been doing a lot of research. She such, kind of suggested, why don't you look down this family line a little bit and see if you find something? And that's where I was able to kind of break through that wall and kind of go around and come at this from another angle. And I'll come back to that in a, in a few slides here and talk about that, the answer that I eventually tied into. <clears throat> so just like in genealogy where we hit a brick wall, we're going to hit that in threat intelligence too. And sometimes you'll find it just, you, you, you know, you may have um, something that just stops you in your tracks. And this is where you have to start getting creative in your research. Um, Sometimes you might want to go through some paid sources. You know, you may need to talk to some, some folks that you work with, maybe uh, reach out to some colleagues that you've worked with in a past, you know, previous, uh, previous stop, maybe do some good, good old-fashioned OSINT. Um, I know kind of an increasingly frustrating avenue for researching domains is privacy managers. You know, a lot of us run into those and we're kind of stopped because um, the, the, the who is information we've had in the past just isn't there anymore. Um, Sometimes we can go through, and if we have some good sources, we can go through and do uh, some historical who is registration information. We might get lucky if the, the, you know, the domain's old enough. Um, and maybe find an old email address that had been used several years ago and start doing some searches on that. Um, one thing I've done and uh, been able to do is um, I'll go through and look at the page source on a, uh, a domain I'm researching. And sometimes you might find something like a Google Analytics ID or some other kind of unique string that's kind of interesting. And then I'll turn around and use um, uh, public www to do a search for that string. And that'll help me tie together several domains that I might not have realized that were associated with each other. So we can start to use some, some different tricks to help us tie things together. Um, another thing I'll do sometimes is I'll look at the IP address. Uh, maybe there's some other domains that are co-located together. Again, you have to be careful with that because it just may be a uh, a public IP address, but if you have two or three uh, different domains on a particular IP, they might be related. Um, another area that, I know there was a talk this morning about um, JA3 hashes. Um, did anybody here get to see that talk? Okay, yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, good talk, um, it's a good concept. Uh, there's a lot of work that's being done in that space that might be, um, might be useful for, for some of this type of research. So kind of break out of that mold and start thinking about different approaches and maybe kind of instead of going in through the front door, maybe go around to the back door and, and get your way in. Oh. Sorry. <clears throat> so that all kind of leads to where I am now. And uh, uh, last year I was able to put together an application for my Sons of the American Revolution uh, uh, membership. And you know, this is not unlike doing a, a, a detailed report, okay? You have to pull all this information together. You have to grab all kinds of birth certificates, death certificates, marriage certificates, any supporting information to help you establish your, your relationship to, to your ancestors. Um, 
I, you know, I took a lot of time and went through and laid this out in a very logical, um, I worked with uh, my sponsor at the um, organization and he helped me lay it out in a very clear, concise manner so we could get the application packets in. And it has to go through several layers of review, just like if you're going through a, uh, a review process for a report you're working on, it's a very similar thing. So I had to go through my local chapter, state level, and then up to the national level folks. So one of the gaps I had in my application, and the state, level, the state officers kind of pointed this out, is my great-grandmother's death certificate wasn't included with, with my application. And he's like, why isn't it here? You, you need this in here. Well, we had, uh, with my local chapter, we decided to not include that because there was a discrepancy. Remember, I talked about embracing discrepancies, right? Well, what, what we found on the death certificate was my great uncle, he had actually gone in, you know, he reported her death and filled out the death certificate. And there was a field in there where he put father's name. Okay. And Uncle Duffy literally put his dad's name instead of his, his mother's father's name. So this was causing, you know, some confusion. To add to that, his father's name and his grandfather's name were both William. So <laughs> there was a lot of, we, you know, we weren't sure, you know, who was what. And so, we, so when I was working with my, my local sponsor, he said, you know, let's, let's put this on the side because this is going to cause some questions. Well, by not putting it in there and explaining it and taking the time to explain, hey, yes, we have this death certificate. We know there's some errors in here. We have supporting documentation showing the re proper relationships here. It caused some questions when it went up to the state level and actually slowed down my application process. So sometimes we think we're trying to be clear and <clears throat> Um, you know, not, you know, just don't pay attention to this. Sometimes it's important to embrace those, those discrepancies. And so we went ahead and put that in and it, uh, it, it cleared some things up. Um, you know, and the other thing that I did, you know, most of the time you're looking for census records and the kind of the, the, the big three that they look for when they can get them are birth certificates, marriage and death certificates. Um, but when you start getting back into the 17 and 1800s, you have to get a little creative. And one of the unusual sources of data that I had, um, I actually had to mail away for this. I couldn't just you know, pull it up online, right? I actually had to you know, kind of get out there and do some things the old way, is I had to send away for a copy of a, um, a, a local history uh, book. And uh, in particular, this was out of uh, Osage County, Missouri, where my grandmother had grown up. And there was a, a, a local history book from 1890 that had a bunch of my family uh, history in there and had a bunch of so-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so. Kind of read like the Silmarillion a little bit. Um, but it was really kind of an interesting thing to go through and see how they came to Osage County and they later came up to Northern Illinois where I grew up. Um, but this was a really useful source for me as well because it allowed me to get back a couple more um, generations. So similar to what I had to go through with the uh, Sons of the American Revolution application, you know, when you do threat intel analysis, at some point you're going to have to put together a report, a write-up. It could be a summary. It could be a long, detailed report. And you're going to have to do the same types of things. You're going to have to document the work that you did. You're going to have to prove you know, what your assertions are, you know, how much confidence do you have in your, your, uh, your assessments, right? Um, and, and it's really it's, it's the same same type of work. You know, you have to carefully go through that write-up, you have to support it, and, you know, document your, your different things. Um, yeah, okay. <clears throat> so, as far as uh, my actual application itself, my, I, the ancestor I ended up going back to his name is James Ford, and he's kind of an interesting person. Um, you can see here this doc, the top, the, the top uh, picture there is from a document called the Journal of the House of Burgesses of Virginia. And uh, James was kind of an interesting guy, like I said. He, um, his father was a, a Huguenot. He came over from, he was a French Protestant who came over to America to escape religious persecution in the late 1700s. Um, and so James was born to his father, John Pierre, and James grew up in uh, just outside of uh, Richmond, Virginia, and he actually participated in the French and Indian War. 
and he was in the Battle of the Meadows. It's also called the Battle of Fort Necessity, which is just, just up over the line in Pennsylvania, which was one of the first battles of the French and Indian War, really started things. And you can see he lost an eye. And so this document that I found was him submitting a claim for restitution. And he, um, he was granted some relief. I forgot the amount, um, but they did approve his, his, uh, his pension request. Um, later on, during the Revolutionary War, you can see in the bottom doc document there, uh, picture there, um, during the Revolutionary War, we didn't necessarily, as a country or as a, a colony that didn't have a lot of money, we would give uh, certificates to say, hey, we'll pay you back later. And so James Ford Sr. actually was given a certificate for three bushels of corn, and he allowed 17 horses to pasture on his land. Um, and he was supporting the Virginia militia. Um, I haven't done any, any look or research on that Armand Legion, but um, that might be something I do down the road. Now, I also know, um, I haven't done the research yet, but I know his son, James Ford C Jr., excuse me, was also, he was a soldier for the uh, Virginia militia. And I'm gonna probably do a, a supplemental application to get, get him notated as well. Um, but this is all you know, part of, this is the, the end result, right? So now, because I've done all this work, I've done all this research, you know, now I'm a member of the Sons of the American Revolution and I can go walk in parades and other you know, things like that. We do uh, a lot of different uh, grave markings and uh, things like that to recognize other Revolutionary War members. Um, do a lot of research or uh, outreach to uh, kids in the schools and things like that. Um, <clears throat> but at the end of the day, when we look at, whether we're looking at family history or whether we're looking at threat intel research, there's a rigor. We need to make sure that we're actually um, you know, going through and, and documenting things properly. We're, we're putting in the work, we're making sure we vet the sources and, and all of those, those things that we have to do. So I'll give you guys back a couple of minutes here, but um, I wanna thank everybody here for coming in and listening to me drone on about my own personal family history. I know it's probably not as interesting to you as it is to me, uh, but thank you for your indulgence. Um, if you. If you haven't been doing any of this and you'd like to you know, talk about how to get started, please come up and see me afterwards. Um, two organizations here, the Sons of the American Revolution, Daughters of the American Revolution. Um, there is another group for children, um, particularly like when I know when I applied, my son and I are, are both considered Sons of the American Revolution. Um, my daughters aren't 18 yet, so they can't join the Daughters of the American Revolution, but there is a Children of the American Revolution organization that they can join. Um, but uh, you know, I'll be here for a little bit if anybody wants to talk shop at all or ask any questions. And uh, just want to thank everybody for your time and uh, thanks for being here.